In 1968, at the Olympic podium, a dramatic event occurred. Two of the three winners of medals, uh, both African Americans, uh, stood and gave the Black Power salute as they collected their medals. And with that, Black Power came fairly dramatically on the stage. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about today is exactly that, the Black Power movement in the United States. So first of all, who am I? I'm Dr. Kevin Ewell, Senior Lecturer in American Studies at the University of Sunderland. Uh, my specialist subject is the history of race in the United States in the 20th century. Most recently, I'm author of Richard Nixon, The Rise of Affirmative Action, The Pursuit of Racial Equality in an Age of Limits. Who are you? You are either an A or AS level student studying civil rights, American civil rights, or you might be simply, somebody simply curious about the subject and you might just want to view this podcast uh, to learn something uh, about this. This is designed uh, basically uh, to be at the level of an undergraduate uh, university student um, and it's really taken from my first year courses that I teach uh, at um, the University of Sunderland. So, in terms of structure, I just want to say exactly uh, what the structure of this. I'm going to deal firstly with the question, what is black power? Uh, what was the black power movement of the 1960s? Second, Malcolm X and black power. A lot of people are curious about the relationship between Malcolm X, uh, who was a, a well-known figure of that period, and black power. Third, I'm going to talk about the context for its emergence. Why did black power emerge uh, when it did. Fourth, Black Power and the Black Panther Party. And fifth, what did Black Power achieve? What is the legacy of Black Power that we can look at and say uh, that it left? So first of all, what is Black Power? Black Power refers to a mo movement in the United States emerging in the 1960s that expressed a new racial consciousness amongst African Americans. Black power covers a variety of perspectives, and even the term was vigorously uh, debated at the time, and it is certainly uh, no less debated amongst historians today. To some, it expressed a racial dignity, uh, economic and social self-reliance, and freedom from white rule. Uh, and this was all advanced by Malcolm X, uh, pre-black power. To others, it meant a new cultural emphasis on black history and black identity, um, and the phrase, black is beautiful, became very popular in the 1960s. To others still, such as Martin Luther King, black power had connotations of violence and separatism. And indeed, this is the way that it was viewed by white Americans, by the majority of white Americans um, at the time. And uh, it was viewed as, as something uh, of, of uh, an evil uh, from uh, the perspective of white America, but also from the perspective of the mainstream civil rights movement's uh, figures uh, who black power often attacked. Finally, still others thought of it in terms of black capitalism as a very mainstream and very conservative movement uh, that simply had uh, black Americans um, in charge of capitalistic companies. So the context for the emergence of black power is very, very important. Uh, the most important aspect that unifies all the definitions of black power is that it emerged from the frustration about the existing struggle for civil rights for African Americans. This was a crucial time in American history where the civil rights movement had been going uh, for a number of years uh, from the uh, Montgomery bus boycott of 1956 uh, right through to uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act signed into law uh, by Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Uh, from this period of time, uh, the civil rights movement exploited a contradiction within post-war American liberalism. And I think it's very important to understand this context of post-war American liberalism and its relationship with the civil rights movement. A very clever exploitation by the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, I think it did an excellent job in some ways. And it won uh, some, it won the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It won the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, and all of these it had some success. But of course, on the ground, the majority of African Americans would not have noticed the changes. The changes were not dramatic. 
uh, African Americans still lived in the ghetto, and uh, for the ordinary African American, uh, the changes were not uh, very evident. And this gave way to a huge frustration, and I think this is the essential background of black power. Whereas the official attitude in Washington and most of the country supported civil rights, uh, full civil rights for African Americans, there was what was termed uh, derisively against President Johnson, the credibility gap. President Johnson uh, was accused of having a credibility gap uh, during his office, and that very much applied for African Americans, uh, despite the official recognition and the official commitment towards um, uh, civil rights, most African Americans would not have noticed the changes. Okay, the parameters, I want to talk a little bit about the parameters of post-war liberalism. Uh, there are many reasons why most Americans believed that African American equality was imminent. It wasn't that unreasonable a proposition at the time. Uh, you look back and you think, why didn't they do more? Well, they thought it was happening um, as a matter of course. Desegregation of the army went smoothly, uh, particularly in the Korean War. Um, the uh, United States Army in the Second World War had been segregated, but by the Korean War, uh, just five years later, um, the uh, U.S. Army was entirely desegregated and the, the whole action went smoothly. So uh, the, the class divisions that had rent the United States in the interwar period seemed to have disappeared um, amidst post-war prosperity. Former colonies in the world uh, were gaining their freedom. There was an atmosphere where it was felt it was very possible for African Americans uh, to achieve uh, what uh, the, the equality that they had been, uh, they had been looking for uh, for the past uh, over 100 years. And full racial equality in the United States did seem to be simply a matter of time. However, as there was not any, as the movement was a little bit glacial, as, as, as Martin Luther King put it, um, there were a growing number of critics. Very, very useful reading that I would point to that's worth you having a look at, that just expresses this so well, is uh, in March 1964, uh, it's called um, Commentary Magazine. It's volume 37, number three, Liberalism and the Negro, a round table discussion. And this included James Baldwin, Nathan Glazer, Sidney Hook, and Gunnar Myrdal. Uh, James Baldwin, you can see on the PowerPoint um, uh, slide. And what this indicates is a great frustration with the existing pro progress on black equality, but a real defensiveness on the part of white liberals. And in fact, it gives you some sense of the brittleness of the liberalism. Although on the surface it was confident, uh, any criticism that was directed at it uh, had, a, had, a, had a very um, undermining effect. And you can really see uh, the defensiveness on the part of uh, the whites, uh, Nathan Glazer, Sidney Hook, and Gunnar Myrdal, who represented very well um, the uh, liberal consensus on race uh, and in the post-war period. I want to talk to you now a bit about Malcolm X. Uh, Malcolm X is a figure who is very familiar, and as you, you can see up here, uh, the picture with him uh, holding a gun. Uh, there, this was on posters as I was growing up, by any means necessary. Malcolm X, uh, very celebrated. He was, subjected by, to, he was the subject of a movie by Spike Lee. Um, he is a very celebrated figure. Interestingly, he's more celebrated now than he was at the time. And in fact, when he met Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King was a much larger figure. Uh, and in fact, the, the sort of uh, retrospective elevation of, of Malcolm X's character um, in uh, the 1980s has much more to do with our own times than it did with his times. Malcolm X, of course, born Malcolm Little, um, was a small-time uh, petty thief and uh, was put into prison, whereby he, he, um, he converted to the nation of Islam um, in prison, which is where many, many young African-American men uh, convert to the nation of Islam, and he came out and uh, became a very important preacher for the nation of, of Islam. And Malcolm X, it's interesting to look back, he was very much hyped by the liberals. He had predecessors preaching separatism, including W.E.B. Du Bois at the turn of the century and uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, 1920s, uh, the Back to Africa movement, 
he had predecessors that were preaching this a, a similar sort of separatism. Uh, but the real um, ascension of Malcolm X onto the world stage was with what's called the hate that hate produced, which contrasted black Muslims with moderate Negroes. And this is actually a fascinating, go to YouTube and you can actually have a look at the original 1959 hate that hate produced and it shows the nation of Islam. And uh, this was a one hour news special. That was back in the days when people did one hour news specials, no more. It's 10 minutes and sitting on a desk and that kind of thing. Uh, but at that stage, this was serious news and it was a one hour um, exploration of the nation of Islam, uh, the black Muslims as they were called. And Malcolm X emerged as a powerful speaker at this time, but the hate that hate produced really sums up uh, what it meant. Because of course this means, um, this is what we were, you know, this is what we have created. This is the monster we have created by not giving uh, full civil rights to African Americans. So American news producers focused on Malcolm X as the bad guy uh, with a stick lurking behind that if we don't act then this is what we have. Malcolm X could be trusted to make outrageous statements. For instance, when Kennedy was shot uh, and killed in 1963, 1963, he said this was the chickens coming home to roost. He was forced by the Nation of Islam to retract that statement. Um, but this is the kind of uh, newsworthy statement that Malcolm X um, uh, very much became a central figure. He inspired some young African Americans who felt that nonviolent protests were having limited effects. Despite not espousing violence particularly, he did espouse self-defense for African American people. Uh, this was very much contrary to the, the perspective of the mainstream civil rights movement who preached nonviolence and who met, uh, met uh, uh, violence by turning the other cheek, taking Christian attitude uh, that uh, so personified by Martin Luther King.